Welcome, Feel Good Fathers. I have my good buddy here, uh, Matt. He is the founder and start, uh, I guess the CEO, the chief coach of the Act, uh, Abundance Activation Mastermind for Entrepreneurs, uh, helping those folks realize their worth and value. Matt's got a fantastic uh, journey. I've been able to help him slightly in engineering this and creating the structure around what this offering is. Matt, I'd love to hear before we get into the nuts and bolts of our discussion, we're going to end up talking about surrogacy. Uh, tell us a little bit about the mastermind. Tell us about your journey, and then we'll jump into the surrogacy discussion. Sure. Thanks, Jay. So happy to be here. So I started my entrepreneurial journey about eight years ago, and I call myself a little bit of an accidental entrepreneur. This wasn't something I was like planning on starting for years and years. I had just been laid off a job. I knew I did not want to work for somebody else again, and I decided to start a consulting business. Um, no um, coincidence intended here, but it is in the baby product industry. I randomly fell into this line of work in 2010 when I moved to New York and started working for baby product manufacturers. It was a very booming industry at the time. A lot of the businesses were actually founded in New York because even rich people still live in a relatively small apartment and were tired of looking at Winnie the Pooh diaper bags sitting around their apartment and wanted something a little bit more aesthetically aligned with their adult lifestyle. Mm. So I started this business and honestly, it was the catalyst for incredible growth and change for me. And I want to help other entrepreneurs um, hopefully avoid some of the pitfalls that I that I fell down. And um, that's why I founded the Abundance Activation Mastermind. What we really do is help entrepreneurs align their um, align their desires, align their um, align their purpose with uh, with their business they're starting, and or the business that they have running. And a big challenge that I faced that I had to work through was that I have um, childhood trauma that was not realized until I started this business, and I had a very difficult time navigating boundary setting and advocating for my needs. And most, I don't want to say most importantly, but most fun because it's the financial part. As I learned to set these boundaries and learn to advocate for my needs, I was able to advocate and negotiate for what I was worth. And I turned this business into a million dollars a year for myself and it completely changed my life. All of this was from learning to set boundaries and listen to myself and advocate for my needs. And I want to help other entrepreneurs do the same. This is a, I think a, a great topic of learning for any father. Cause what most of us, I, I'm not really a big prescriber to the idea that the majority of us are people pleasers. I think that that is, uh, it's, it's a common trope that at least in the circle of, of those discussions that most people want to do it, but I do be, like want to like that identify as a people pleaser, but I do believe that especially for men, we don't have a really good understanding of what the heck is a boundary. And then number two, how to enforce that. And then I guess number three, the other part is asking and as having your needs fulfilled. I think that is something that all adults have, have issues with and not very many people are able to ask for that, especially in, um, I'm thinking here in a romantic context. And then I'm also thinking about it as a father or as a parent parental context. I think there's really a, a, a full lack of understanding of those concepts. I, I'd love to hear sort of a little bit more into how do you move through that what could a feel good father listen to you and what you're about to say to learn about boundaries and asking uh, for what your needs are? I love that. And yeah, I mean, it's funny. I've never really heard anybody say that, but it's true. I don't think that the majority of people are people pleasers. I think the majority of people aren't people pleasers and they sort of make it very difficult for people who can't set boundaries. And those people are the ones that become people pleasers and, um, it's, you know, you're giving away your agency when you are a people pleaser and taking care of others. 
Uh, for me, so, you know, growing up, my situation was interesting. Um, I had no friends at all at school for about four years. And I just always thought something was wrong with me because I didn't have any friends. And um, I, you know, my dad was a sports fan. He tried to get me to play sports. I do not have a sports bone in my body. Even now, um, the Super Bowl party, the, you know, the biggest appeal for me is the food. Um, I appreciate that other people enjoy, I mean, enjoy sports. To be clear, I know I'm the anomaly. This is a multi-gazillion dollar industry. So nothing wrong with uh, most people for liking sports. But um, yeah, I mean, I just always grew up thinking something was wrong with me for being so different. And I acted out because of it. And um, I'm not going to, you know, um, overshadow that part. I wasn't necessarily the easiest child for my parents. But I think now we know that when kids are acting out like that, something is wrong and we're not mm -hmm. supposed to continue to try to get them to 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 be quiet because they're crying for help. And that was a big part of my 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 childhood and you know i mean as i became older i did start to make a ton of friends i never really questioned it but like as i became an adult i i really have more friends than most people i know actually and they're good friends i mean this isn't like just you know all party friends it's i have you know 20 30 really really close friends right now i would say that i that i um love and that love me and i never really um I mean, I never really thought anything of it. I never really thought anything of my childhood. And then when I started this business, I had um, a lot of needs placed on me. You know, I mean, every like, you know, your clients are are going to try to get everything they can from you. And I didn't really know that, like, in a business setting, you are able to set boundaries and you are able to tell somebody what you um what you expect from the relationship. It's funny, like we call like the, you, you know, the contract, uh, like an agreement. And to me, like I always kind of, I had no idea that was like a negotiation type thing in terms of like what the working environment was supposed to be like for both mm. people. <laughs> I thought it was honestly just a financial obligation, you know, I mean, a financial negotiation where we figure out who gets paid what and whatever. But like, now that I've, become adept in this department, I've seen like the agreement is agreeing on working terms. And that means something as, you know, simple as like, hey, like I don't work on Fridays or don't ever text me past 3 p.m. or whatever. Those are all things that we work out in the agreements. And um, yeah, I just like, you know, like when I became an entrepreneur, I didn't know that there was an alignment needed in who we choose as our clients and we say no when somebody's not our fit and i think that i was a very big people pleaser and um i really don't wish that on my worst enemy to be somebody who is stuck in the people pleasing role because it just it's a very difficult place to be and that's what i'm really trying to bring awareness to as i navigate through the world is helping people get out of this and work through their trauma I was just reflecting on your agreement part because I think that's so it's so uh, underthought of. The vast majority of us are going to enter into some sort of employee relationship with whoever it is that we're working for, and in those environments, when it, especially when I'm thinking as a as a former corporate employee, that bound you you can't always say no. <laughs> so I have a very direct experience with this where I had somebody I was reporting to and I was like, no, I'm not, I'm not doing that. And it, it, the boundary I thought was very healthy because I was doing it for family. Uh, but it, it certainly created some friction in the space. And I think that because we're so acclimatized this environment of working in and working for somebody else that is dictating the terms of that engagement, we're not brought up to advocate for ourselves. That's not a skill that anybody really develops. Uh, you know, I think of, you know, as, as two gentlemen, you know, I think of, well, for me, for sports, I had a coach, the coach was telling me what to do. Your teacher's telling you what to do. There's an engagement. Most of the time it's not negotiation. So I can see how that would be really challenging to learn as an adult. So what, when you're, when you're setting these boundaries, what's a, what's a framework for thinking around setting good and healthy boundaries for you? 
That's um, that's a good question. <clears throat> so I think that like, I mean, it isn't, I mean, it is a challenging process of setting boundaries in a challenging situation because we can't say no to everything, but we can, I think that the boundary starts when we're starting a relationship, you know, we are able to choose how we start a relationship. And I think that's where the agency really starts to um, be something that we all are able to implement on our own. We are able to execute that. So like if you're starting a job, it really, I mean, and I know that this is a privileged place to be in and we don't all have the flexibility to align our external environments perfectly with what we need. But I think that we can, whatever the situation is, I do think that there needs to be some negotiation and there does need to be some sort of, um, stating our needs, you know, so like if you're starting a job and if working out is important to you in the morning, like the small things, starting with the small things and getting an understanding for the person you're working with and um, just understanding their character. Like if they're blowing their lid about you saying that I want to work out in the morning and I'm not going to be able to be in the office before eight o'clock, then that probably is something that we need to really consider when we're making a decision. But I think that like when it comes to setting boundaries, like in a more entrepreneurial setting, which is really why I focus on entrepreneurs is because we do have more agency over our days. And that's something that I really have been able to change for myself. When I worked for a corporate in a corporate setting, there's I mean, there's not as much flexibility. But when you are an entrepreneur, you really are in charge of your own destiny in a very unique and special way that if you really are open to growing and learning how to set boundaries and learning how to align your life with what is important to you, you can create the life that you'd like to have for yourself. And I think that, um, you know, we do have the opportunity as an entrepreneur to really learn those skills. Mm. I'm thinking about the conversations you would have with your spouse or your partner on what are the boundaries and what are your needs? Cause I, I'm, we're a really big advocate here in the feel good community for feel good fathers to that. Anything that you're doing in a professional capacity, it is translatable to your private life. Mm -hmm. So if you're learning to set boundaries as a professional, that you're also, um, learning about your needs and your boundaries in your private life. You know, I think of the common, like for me, it's like, I have a dairy allergy. And so, you know, for a long time with my, you know, with my wife, it was, there was milk in the house, (laughs) you know? And then over time that just became the non-dairy alternative. Uh, She still keeps cheese much to my chagrin because it smells you know, cheese, good cheese smells. So (laughs) there's that piece, but there's that, just that understanding of like, Hey, if we're going to have that, we've already, we've always got to have this dairy alternative. And now it's like, we don't even have regular cream or milk. It just become a simplicity thing to, to keep the house simple. Okay. I think, I think we're good here. I think that we, we understand it. I love the idea that as a, and I would translate it as well. You know, you said as an entrepreneur, you're the master of your destiny. I think as a parent in your house, you also are the master of your destiny. And it takes uh, some simple, some similar skills to make that happen. Now, I th- now I'd love to, to sink my teeth into this new topic, surrogacy. And I'm, I'm chiefly interested because I don't know anything about it. And I, I, I'm just really curious to learn everything I can. I think the Feel Good Father community, we are deeply curious by nature. We just want to hear it. So start at the beginning. <laughs> what, what can we talk about here with regards to surrogacy? Wow. Um, yeah. I mean, I guess I kind of take for granted like that. I mean, I didn't know much about it until I started looking into it. But um, I mean, I would first start by saying that like until I went on this healing journey, I didn't ever think that I would be a father. I just kind of always told myself, like I said, that something was wrong with me. I legitimately looked at myself and thought that, you know, you're just not like, you know, you're just not capable of being a father. Mm. And um, it was through the healing. It was through the learning how to take care of myself that I realized that none of us are perfect at parenthood. And I the fact that I was willing to show up, the fact that I'm still willing to show up really made me a more ideal father than a lot of people out there who are going forward 
with becoming a parent. And I really want to chan- channel my Bob Ross. You got to have some shadow to see the light, right? Yeah. You got to have the dark, you got to have the contrast on your painting. And it's the same thing in life. Nobody's perfect. Everybody's where they're at. Everybody's going through their thing and everything you learn, uh, you as a father, you as a mother stand on the giants of other people that have survived through far worse than anything that we will ever go through. (laughs) So it's like, so I think that in that world, on that vein, you have everything on the inside instinctually to be a good father. And I'm just glad that you've internalized that consciously, uh, in your brain. Thank you. And it's, I mean, it really is sad for me. Like that. I mean, you think that I almost missed out on this. I'm 40 years old now and um, we're starting our surrogacy journey now, which kind of best case, it's going to be about a year and a half. Um, I, I, this is not exactly my ideal situation to be a 42 year old father. No offense to anybody who wants to be a 42. There's plenty of people out there that do it. No, I mean, I mean, I think it's, it's just for me, one of my traumas that I haven't quite worked through yet is that, um, I, you know, I do worry about my physical health more than the average person. And it scares me that, you know, just that the older you get, the more you do need to worry about that a little bit. And, um, but like a lot of people will say like, you know, I don't want to, or that they're concerned about their energy levels. I'm not concerned about my energy levels. I feel better than I've ever felt in my life. But, um, I'm just really grateful that like, I mean, that I figured this out now and not when it was later, because I'm really excited about this journey. So um, I will, um, you know, give you a little bit of uh, what I've learned along the ways in this journey. So, um, for, for, I mean, so first of all, surrogacy is very expensive. Um, I, I feel really, really fortunate that I'm able to um, go down this path. And I know a lot of people can't. The cost of it ranges between about one hundred and eighty and two hundred and twenty thousand dollars. And um, you know, when we were first starting on this journey, we were thinking that we wanted to have twins because that is less expensive. That's not the only reason we wanted to um, go down the twin journey. But as uh, as we've kind of flushed through this more um, more regular more rigorously, I think biting off two children is a little bit more than what we're uh, uh, more than what we're willing and able to do on the first round here. So um, you know. It's been interesting, too, because like the process, it's not a very sexy or glamorous process. And I keep trying to like get myself more excited about the actual process. Don't get me wrong. I'm very excited about the outcome. But, you know, it's a project like anything else. You know, it's a lot of legal documents. It's managing a few different agencies. There are people involved, first of all. I'm a very trusting person, and I also am very compassionate towards the woman in this um you know, in this equation, it's been kind of surprising to hear this because a lot of the agencies we've spoken to, they speak to us probably, they speak to us a little bit interesting about the woman carrying the baby. Like they don't really give them the amount of respect that I would, that I would assume that, that, that we should be giving them. I mean, that I would be giving them. And, um, yeah, so it's, you know, it's been an interesting, um, it's been an interesting, I mean, it's been an interesting journey. Well, awesome. Thanks so much for the details on the mastermind entrepreneurship, discussing boundaries and, and, and setting and communicating your needs. Now we're on to, as we mentioned before, this whole surrogacy thing. And I'm, I'm really excited because I, I don't know many people that have engaged in, in surrogacy. I don't know much about the process. I have a little bit of familiarity with adoption, a little bit of familiarity with IVF, but this is an entirely new world that we're stepping into. I would love to just hear from you. What's the experience like? What uh, what would a feel good father want to know? Because this this whole process from a futuristic, humanistic perspective, this is sort of the direction that we're going. I think that this this concept and everything that's surrounding this whole um, surrogacy aspect of humanity is going to be something that I think is going to be much more commonplace and common knowledge moving forward. Uh, what 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 should we know about it, Matt? There's a lot to know about this, and yeah, I mean, it's a you know, it's been an interesting journey. Like, I think that it's not the funnest journey. (laughs) I mean, I have to be honest about it. I think that it's almost like a little bit, um, 
it's almost a little bit like for me, the past few months as we've been struggling to really like pull the trigger on this, it's been, I've been feeling a little bit shameful almost like, why am I not more excited about this? And it finally hit me about three months ago. I'm not overly excited about the journey of surrogacy because it is contracts. It's dealing with people. It's not very sexy. Like you're kind of picking a baby and a, and a, well, you're picking, let me back up a tiny bit here. So you have a few different people involved. You have the egg donor and that is not the same as the mother or the, mm. I'm sorry, that is not the same as the person carrying the baby, the woman carrying the baby. Mm. And then in our case, my partner, I'm a gay man and we're going to use our sperm. Um, so there's the three people involved in this whole process, including, not including the lawyers and then the IVF agency that does the implant. And then you have the doctor that care or the OBGYN that cares for the, um, I'm the woman carrying the baby. So it's almost like I've been sort of shaming myself thinking like, gosh, why am I not more excited about this process? Because when you're a heterosexual couple that gets to conceive naturally, it's a little bit more exciting. And I have, um, and it's almost like, you know, we're kind of having to, we're kind of having to like get comfortable with the unsexiness of the process. And like, we're choosing an egg donor based off of looks, which is like something that like, I think as a society, we're kind of trained to not base things off of the outside, what's on the cover. So that in and of itself is just weird to be like, I'm picking this this the this egg donor based off of like her hair color her eye color her skin color mm. and um it's interesting and it's a little bit of a moral dilemma and um then on top of that you know we uh y- y- the 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 cost of the process is extremely prohibitive and something that i've had to work around one of the um you know, one of the challenges that I have from childhood is I do have some financial trauma. Just, you know, I think all of our parents handled money in a way that created limiting beliefs. My parents were um, very good savers, a lot of always saving for tomorrow. So to spend $200,000 on surrogacy, it's been quite the growth edge to really allow myself to, for my partner and I, and I to allow ourselves to give ourselves something so so, so abundant. So, 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 I mean, so big. And then with that also, um, you know, I mean, it's, I mean, it's a huge chunk of our savings that's gonna, that could be going towards college or be going towards something else that we're having to get comfortable with. So, um, we find the egg donor and then there's agencies that, that help out with any and all parts of this. We are more of the one throat to choke type people. So to have one agency to sort of manage like the whole process rather than to go. Got it. Full suite. Okay. I was like, what? I was like, I don't understand this analogy, but got it. A full suite, a full service, a full service agency. I I get it. I had to, I had to translate that to marketing speak in a minute here with my head. Like, what's he talking about? Okay. Keep going. Yeah. As I said that, I realized probably not the best analogy for this, but that's, (laughs) um, anyhow, but yes, a full service agency that will handle the whole process for us and look over everything. And, um, so then we also choose the surrogate and that's really the most difficult part right now, because this all changed during COVID Mm -hmm. where a lot of these surrogates are, are moms, are people that have two of their own kids at home and COVID changed things quite a bit where moms are not as eager to have another pregnancy right now. So there is a shortage of surrogates right now, which has also driven the price up. And then, and, and I mean, in, I mean, and then for all of this, there is the legalities of it, you know, so there's massive contracts and um, it's just like a really interesting process. And there's international opportunities as well. We were actually looking into an agency in Mexico, which I was really excited about. We were both really excited about it. And um, my partner's Vietnamese. I'm, I'm, I'm a Caucasian. So like, we're all about having like a very um, ethnic family. But then like, so we kind of get down this like journey of, uh, you know, surrogacy in Mexico and realize you need to like move to Mexico for two months and stay there after the baby's born. Mm. And 
that throws, you know, up, I mean, I mean, obstacles in the um, plan as well. But um, the whole process, all said and done, it is legitimate. It seems very safe. There's, I don't have any concern. Like one of the questions I get the most is like, what happens if the surrogacy doesn't take? Then like the, the, the price is roughly around $200,000, but it could range from 180 if things go really well to 220 if things don't go as well. So they're not charging you $200,000 each round. You're- that That's a factor of, of the IVF process. Uh, so, so my wife is actually an ultrasound. She's worked in a, a couple IVF offices. She's definitely worked in women's health. She's definitely worked for OBGYN. So I hear a little bit on my side, uh, but the, I think that the 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 opening statement here to, to make would be not every fertilized egg works. It's it's the same as a regular pregnancy, and so we're what what you're talking about is that during the process, it's not always viable, or something goes wrong, or or something like that. And so that's the I we don't have to get into this part. It kind of opens up a lot of discussion uh, that I quite frankly, don't really want to have on the show, but it's just, just for the feel good fathers to understand at a high level that that's exactly what's happening is that, um, uh, so the range now makes, makes a a ton of sense. So one of the, one of the things that's common for, for fathers is that the child is not real. Uh, the, the child typically isn't real absent a handful of things like an ultrasound, like seeing the ultrasound is usually the first moment for dads where it's real uh, feeling that kick, how, uh, what does it like from the, from the surrogate perspective, like, is she, she's going to be living at home? Is it, how does, how much interaction do you have, um, with, with the, with mom and babe? You know, I'm a very compassionate person on this end. (laughs) And, um, there are situations I've been a little bit surprised about how the agencies talk about the surrogates. They're not like being mean, but it's just like, I think I've heard things like, you know, the carrier, you know, they don't really say like the woman carrying your baby, yes. which is how I would refer to her. Um, you know, like this is kind of deep a little bit, but like I personally would not expect a stranger, a woman to die for my unborn child. Right. I think that some people would expect that. Um, I would absolutely not expect that. Um, I also don't really feel overly comfortable telling her what to eat and what not to. Right. So I would probably be on the much more compassionate side to her. Um, I don't need to see her, you know, frequently. I don't like if she happened to live in Los Angeles where I live. Great. Then I would love to be a bigger part of her life. But um, from what I gather by talking to the agencies, there are um parents that want, or dads in my situation that want a lot more control than what I want, but I have a lot of respect and compassion and I wouldn't want that if I were her. It's fascinating. I, um, this whole, it's, it, it, there's this whole world of crazy futuristic science fiction organ and surrogacy world and, and, and stuff like that, that I think is, uh, maybe, maybe over coffee sometime we would continue that, but I'd I'd love to understand a little bit more of okay, so you're you're in this stage of the process. What as it's been explained to you, what are your expectations for right impregnation, IVF, all the way through birth? Like what I, I really want to know what your involvement is because we're contrasting that with you know natural birth. I, you're there every step of the way, kind yeah. of thing, <laughs> or you can be right. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I mean, it's like a lot of this is, <laughs> I mean, my mind just goes to like laboratories and contracts. That's what a lot of the involvement is. And it's yeah. been, um, you know, like I've had some shame about this. Like, why am I not more, I don't want to say excited. It's enthusiasm. Why am I not more enthusiastic <laughs> about starting this process? And um, the involvement isn't, it is nothing like what a natural childbirth would be. You know, I mean, it's very likely that given that we're in California and you brought something up, they do have the option, like, you know, for people that have donated eggs and been successful in it before, their prices go way up. Um, but they can pretty well genetically test whether or not someone should be um, viable or not. I don't, what What do you mean? <laughs> well, some of these donated eggs before and it's worked, their price, like the price of those eggs could be double or triple of what somebody who hasn't 
donated before, but they all have to go through a test, through rigorous testing that does make us think that they should be viable. But like if someone's done it before and we really want that guarantee, the cost could be quite a bit more on that. This is That's fascinating. Yeah. So why, but why it's fascinating is because I think that there are some people, they're not like they're baby making machines. My wife and I were baby making machines. If, if, if we're just kind of like, yeah, let's do it. It's not long for us. <laughs> we're just, we're just, we're very compatible in that way. But I also know that there's a lot of people where it's not straightforward. Yeah. And so I think, it, I think that the, the thing for me, I'm, I'm going to be completely mercenary here for just a second. It's fascinating that there's a, a pricing, like a, a mercenary, almost like economical, oh, in the past, this donor has this much success rate, their fee goes here. And I guess like in the econ and economies of scale in any sort of business, right? Like you're going to get that, right? You're going to get the best success rate is going to be the, the top dollar. It's it's just, it, it's crazy. It, it It feels so much like the Wild West to something that is... Um, I think a gift, right? Surrogacy is a gift for people that couldn't otherwise have children. And um, I, I personally think that all men that want to should have the opportunity to be a father. All mothers that want to should have an opportunity to be a mother um, in whatever form that takes. Um, okay. So that was, that was my brief aside there, just from the, I had to, I'm digesting as you're saying this fascinating field for me. And so that's, that's why I'm interrupting and no, monologue. And you're making me think about this too. I mean, you said it so clearly right now. Like everyone should have the opportunity. And I'm telling you, pricing wise, this is really prohibitive for a lot of people. Yeah. And that's what's really unfortunate about it. And I know that you know, even for 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 people having, um, like for a heterosexual couple, IVF is is prohibitive for 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 a lot of couples. And from what I understand, this is three to four times what IVF even costs, you know, so it's, which is, um, which is still more expensive than adoption, right? Adoption go anywhere from 10,000 to 30,000. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then, and that's not even talking about the, the hoops that, that people go through when they're uh, in the foster system, the mm -hmm. foster care system. So it's, it's, it's really weird. I think that, um, when, when I think of the economic status, right, there's, there's some of us that you know, like, like Matt, like you've shared that you're incredibly blessed that you have this opportunity for this investment. Um, parents have kids everywhere. Right. And, and there's, and, and we're, if we're talking about the earth today, 2 billion people are in subsistence level farming communities, 2 billion people live in what we would, what you and I consider modern living, modern economies, modern sky rises in huge cities. And, uh, so it's, there's a, a, a vast, there's a vast, uh, economical distribution of the human race. And so, um, and we still make kids like you would say that it's, it's a unique identifier of, of, of animals on this planet is <laughs> procreation. Okay. I'm getting, again, too philo philosophical here. So <clears throat> what, uh, walk us through a little bit more. So you got the IVS, we're at the IVS stage. What happens after, after this in, in the process as it's been explained to you? Yeah. So once the, um, so once the surrogate is, is determined to be pregnant, then it's just like a normal pregnancy. And I do understand that to be when the legal contract stuff eases up a little bit and we do get to enjoy the process, assuming everything goes well health wise. But again, you know, I mean, this is a stranger that I, I don't, I mean, I'm not trying to like make her life. I mean, she's doing a huge favor to us. So like, I, I mean, I don't see myself, you know, texting her every other day, asking her how she's doing. <laughs> Although if she's happy to give us that information, great. But um, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, it, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a little bit of a business relationship. I have a colleague recently who, who was a surrogate. She, you know, she, and she talked to my partner and I, and she said it was a beautiful experience. She loved doing it. And um, she, I think her words were, were verbatim. Like, I think every woman who wants to should have an opportunity to do this because you just never get a chance to do something so nice for a stranger. Mm. And um, mm. so, I mean, I think that there are a lot of good experiences like that where the, where the um, you know, the couple gets to have a relationship with the surrogate that's compassionate. But um, 
And then like the question I get the most is like, what happens if she has the baby and like wants to keep it? So <laughs> um, that's from what I understand through work, through talking with the agencies, that's not something that really ever happens. Like they very, very, very um, well vet out the surrogate to make sure that this is something that's not likely to happen on her end. So I understand. And then, she has a baby and then we part ways, you know, I mean, I think if, I mean, for me, like I said, I'm a very compassionate person. And, um, like, I know that there's even been like questions about like, did, like, does she get to hold the baby after? Like I would be fine with her holding the baby after if she would like to. Um, hmm. but I think some people are really, really, you know, careful about it and they all have their own limiting beliefs and their own, um, and some of the, I mean, everyone, I mean, I'm definitely self-acknowledging that I'm on the much more liberal and compassionate side of this thing. So, um, but, you know, I mean, it's funny just talking through this with you. Like, I feel like the energy and the excitement in my story definitely um, grows quite a bit towards the end of the process <laughs> because it gets a lot more fun. But at the beginning, like I said, it's, you know, it's a lot of science and a lot of um, contracts and a lot of conversations. And, you know, I mean, and, th and that's the thing, like, you know, you were talking about this like financially and, and, um, you know, kind of like the capitalistic society we're in, but it's like in this process, like I say this, like, I think the woman might get like something like 30 to $40,000 for being a sir. I would want more than 30 or $40,000 for doing that job. So no one here is really making out like a bandit. It's a lot of people here that have a lot of, um, like there's a lot of hands in the cookie jar and, um, I think it's a really beautiful process and I think we're very fortunate that this is an option, but I wanted to mention this. I mean, there is some judgment. I've definitely had, um, I've been a little surprised a few people have come my way and said that this is like something that's just morally um, something that they're just shocked that's even existent in the world. And I'm a compassionate person and let that get to me a little more than some might <laughs> when I'm working I, through it. I think, I think a lot about, you know, I, I think that it's, it, it's challenging from the perspective of, I think uh, like the, the thing for me was like, uh, um, what's the blue pill, the blue pill for erectile dysfunction. Um, uh, I know it starts with the V. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Viagra. There we go. <laughs> right. So I'm thinking about, all right. So we live in a world where you can get a pacemaker. If you have a heart attack, you can, um, uh, you can detect genetic issues with your child during, uh, during the, the, uh, not the labor process, but during the pregnancy, mm -hmm. um, this, you know, you can, and then with IVF and I remember way back, way back in the day, I remember I had huge judgments around it, but it, I mean, even today I'm kind of like, I don't morally, I don't think is, is really even a factor there. I don't think there's any moral issue with what's happening right now because again it comes down to there's a lot of people that there's a lot of people that i think would make great parents that through let's call it bad luck have genetics that that don't work in their favor with regards to what i'll call their piping uh whether it's he or she right um and uh, this is all just meant to be a gift. I think being a parent is, is something that is beautiful. I think that it is something that is, um, I think that I'm excited to hear what you have to say, but I know for me, and I know for many feel good fathers that, uh, there's a well of experience that was not available to me before I was a parent. Mm -hmm. There was getting married being with my wife, having a spouse, the whole thing opened up. I'd say that was like a linear increase in who I was as a person, but I would say that becoming a parent was an exponential increase into who I was and what my capacity was for um, just compassion and fulfillment in general and satisfaction. Uh, as, as I said before, I think this is a gift. I um, it It boggles my mind. I think that What's what the the only thing that I would I would say this is that all new technologies like this begin very expensive. They begin very it's a it's a luxury element, and over time it becomes something that is commoditized. 
And um, that is a function of any economy, <laughs> right? So it's not, it's neither here nor there, neither good nor bad. Uh, but this is enough about me. Uh, Matt, I would love to have some closing thoughts from you on um, on just fatherhood and, and surrogacy as, as you as you understand fatherhood and as you're uh, going through this experience. Yeah. Thank you for saying that. Like the way you said it too, because like, this is, you know, like we laugh. I mean, I'm 40 years old. My partner is 37 and a half now will be 38 soon. And um, our lives are like, you know, like we laugh at this and it's just like in the morning we wake up, we have jazz music playing while we listen to our, to where I read our books. A few years ago, I'm a girlfriend of mine came over. She was like sick on her way to work. and had to stop by and she has two kids. And I just will never forget her looking around at us just being like, oh my gosh, this is your life. Like without kids, like you get to like, there's no one running around. The house is clean. So it's, <laughs> it's taken like, I mean, it's been, I mean, I'm laughing saying this because it's true. It's like, you know, I mean, we have, you know, I don't know, 15, 20 gay couple friends that we have in our lives. We're literally the only ones that are having, um, I mean, that are having a baby that are, I mean, that I mean, that are doing this. And, um, when it comes down to it, it's just like what you said, Jay, it's like, there's kind of something missing in my life. Like, would I, will, will I be okay if this didn't happen for some reason? I will probably be okay. I think I won't be perfect. I want to say, I mean, I think it, there's going to be something missing and it really, um, you know, like I see, I see also like, you know, the healing that I've done and just like how, how I've healed from my childhood and just like the openness that I have and just like, I'm a huge Oprah fan and just the things that she's taught me, like apologizing to your child when you do something wrong. Mm -hmm. None of us are perfect. We're going to say something we shouldn't say. And that's unreasonable to think that you're going to make the perfect choice every time, but it's how you recover from it and how you address it after something happens. And I'm really mm -hmm. excited to hopefully raise a, pretty standout child and uh, help them navigate through the world and do the right thing. Because I believe underneath everything, I mean, we're all working with so much shame. And, um, you know, I think the more that you help somebody realize the human experience that it's okay to be imperfect, that's, that's, that's one of the biggest secrets to life is just being able to be humble and to be kind to yourself while you grow. And I'm really excited for that. Thank you. I'm very excited for you. Thanks so much. Matt Gerlach, everybody.